So what I'm going to talk about is uh, one of uh, uh, the software innovation we uh, introduced in X2, which, which is really uh, impacting directly uh, application performance and therefore is, uh, uh, is a key differentiator uh, in X2. So um, this is a marketing-like picture of... Uh, uh, <laughs> but eventually what we really see here is we are talking here about five times improvement in latency, which is very, very significant. And I'll show uh, one slide showing a, a specific workload with this kind of uh, improvement. Uh, now, OK, so let's start with uh, why or where, why are we doing it? So actually, we, Extreme IO has a, a pretty big, maybe one of the biggest install base of uh, all flash arrays. And we looked across our install base. And what we saw is that more, more than 65% of the user IOPS are small IOPS, meaning that the latencies we get on the small IOPS uh, really impact eventually the user. Um, and, and when we looked at this problem, um, we decided to solve it in order to improve the, uh, the overall uh, application performance. Now this, by the way, correlates also with some uh, other storage vendors also seeing the same, uh, same kind of uh, pattern of, of a high rate of uh, small IOPS, you, uh, at least one I, I'm familiar with. You're seeing more 4Ks than most of the data I see, but not by much. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so in order to explain what did we do, I'll go over how does a small write looks like in an X1 mm -hmm. uh, system. So a data uh, arrives uh, to the R model, goes to the compute. We've uh, been through this, so it's a small write. So in order to build the new page and calculate to hash, to know where, where I need to write this data. So I need to read from the old data module. I need to read uh, the old data to build up the new page, calculate the hash, and then uh, uh, send this data to the new data model and obviously journal it and then uh, acknowledge the user. So this, uh, uh, this overall uh, process really impacts especially the latency of a small IO and, and that's the, the thing we wanted to attack and address. So what happens in uh, X2 with the feature we call it a uh, write boost. So in X2 we have the same I.O. arrives, gets the computer model, we journal it, and acknowledge the user. That's it. So here we get this huge latency improvement comparing to X1. It will, have a, it will improve the latency also for uh, bigger blocks than small blocks, but obviously in the small blocks, this is a game changer. Later on, we uh, collect such a group of pages, do the same operations we did obviously, but now we do this uh, together on all these pages together, and then send them to their, uh, to their uh, data corresponding data model. So here we benefit also from the aggregation. Obviously, when you, do, when you are processing I.O. Uh, by itself, it's more wasteful in CPU, in IB bandwidth, and other parameters. So you overall gain here also, uh, 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 you do eventually less work. So you're, but you're the compute module, when you're hardening it there, it's because of the NVRAM card, right? Yeah. So, so basically, you're now doing what NetApp and Nimble have been doing, yeah. so right? It looked like Castle from yeah. the side of things. How you write it down? You write in, acknowledge it. <laughs> Once it is and it's protected in NVRAM, you can acknowledge it. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I have here. I'll, I'll summarize what we are doing, and uh, and uh, uh, the thing here is how we do it, and can we do it alongside with all the other features we support? And so because Extreme AI is eventually about giving you the performance consistency while you have uh, snapshots, dedupe, compression, random workload, everything all together. So as I said, game changer latency for small write, we improve the latency over, obviously also for regular write. Because of the aggregation, we also got better overall uh, uh, performance because we reduce the work. So, uh, and how is it different or what's special about it? So first of all, it's small. We don't require, in order to get this, few gigabytes of NVRAM is enough to get this performance gain. And the other thing is that uh, it's more of an architectural question. This uh, write boost sits beyond the logical layer and not above it, meaning that any operation you do on the logical layer is not, is not affected. You don't need to flush anything or maintain some kind of pointers 
to remember where, what snapshot does an entry belong to, and, and such stuff. Questions? Okay, so this is a, a, an example of uh, OLTP workload with a 20% update, update. So we get here a, a IOPS improvement of 26%, and the big difference is going down to 0.63 millisecond latency. This is just one example. Uh, uh, it's our CTO has many other recorded examples. Uh, due to time limitation, we only show in here this. Um, that's it for the right boost. Any questions? Okay, so uh, now we are going to uh, the third uh, uh, section. So, Exima snapshots, as Todd mentioned, snapshots are just volumes in every sense uh, of the way. So, they don't consume any metadata overhead, only the diffs. They are constraint-free, uh, constraint-free, writable, refresh, restore, any to any. They are 16K granular, both obviously no, uh, no data uh, over it, but also in metadata efficient. It's inherently thin provisioned. Um, so uh, metadata is consumed only in the uh, granularity of your diff. Um, performance is the same for snapshots. No performance for uh, creating a volume, which happen, a snapshot, which happens instant instantaneously. Same for deletion. Uh, we use dirty tree, which is something that really helps us guarantee consistent performance while you have snapshots and snapshot hierarchy, and also for searching for diff and other, other stuff, uh, which is another uh, uh, unique technology of Extreme IO. So, as I said, all the operations, both delete, diff, merge are all proportional to the real diff you have. Um, and all this is based on a data, data very, very efficient in-memory data structure that allows us to be in memory. What's the uh, fastest cycle you can use for snapshots? How, what, what do you mean? How it's fast can I, can I, can I make a, a, a pseudo CDP solution with a snapshot every minute? Yes. Sure, you can, you can do in seconds. Like, no, that's great. Uh, by the way, you can take your time. We're, we're, we have more time than we thought we did. Ah, okay. So uh, it's changing <laughs> plans. <laughs> <laughs> so we will uh, look at this picture. So, uh, okay, so I'll go back for a second. So uh, this is just an illustration of, 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 uh, of what we have. I'll do it quickly anyway. So you have a one production volume. This layer here represents the logical metadata layer. So now we took a snapshot. So we have this. Uh, kind of split. Now you have, this is the production volume and we have an, another snapshot, sorry. This is, this layer represents basically nothing yet. It doesn't consume anything, but both, uh, both uh, uh, volumes uh, inherit from the shared metadata. Now, let's see what happens uh, when a new data block arrives to the production. It's a unique data block. It will get referenced in the hash space and then in a physical space. And it will, this entry will be updated in the data structure correlated to this snapshot production, uh, to this production volume. So the size of this metadata is, is, is only for one holding one hash and not, no, no kind of redirect on write or any kind of other copy. Same goes for the uh, for the other uh, snapshot that was generated in this uh, snapshot creation. Okay, so this was all introduction to the uh, asynchronous native replication. It's very important to understand this because our asynchronous application is based on the snapshots. So um, we are talking about uh, uh, asynchronous native replication with very easy operation. It's based on extreme IO in memory snapshots simple and, e and easy, uh, full operational uh, cluster recovery, best protection, RPO as low as 30 seconds. Just talk with uh, some of the de developers, they are, they are talking about you can go down to 10 seconds. Why are we saying 30 seconds? And you can go up to days. Um, nearly immediate recovery, uh, thousands of recovery points in time, Fanning configuration and obviously leveraging scale out performance. All controllers partic participate in the uh, replication pro process. Um, all the efficient metadata uh, where replication, we will talk about it in a second. And obviously, gaining the dedupe and compression on the aware array and the awareness of this uh, uh, while we do replication. 
So, just a quick question on that previous slide. What do you mean by fan in? Oh, thinking of it. Uh, in here we are talking about uh, many to one uh, configuration in uh, replication. Okay, so here are kind of bullets of of properties or highlights of the uh, of the replication. So the the slides without the images are the slides that usually I added. Uh, so uh, uh, so as I said, it leverages the extreme IO uh, snapshots, and in this one slide I'll just go over kind of the process. How do we leverage the snapshot for that, uh, in case it will not be clear? So all the performance, scale, everything, all the good stuff I said about the, the snapshots uh, affect the, the, the asynchronous application and enable us to deliver this uh, solution. So one of the key things here, as I said, it's a native replication. <coughs> And, uh, and, and, and when I say here native application, it means that we really gain from both the uh, CAS architecture and of the, of the inline uh, properties of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the arrays. So we're talking about DDoP aware. We will never move data if it already, already exists in the target block. Doesn't matter if it came from this array or for some other reason we have the, this data. Um, zero teaming obviously happens here. Write folding, if you have a kind of hierarchy, many writes, overwrites, and whatever, will only, only take the diff, will not take the history. If the data, data that is compressed will be, we will leverage the array compression, it will uh, transfer the data already compressed, saving more in the link uh, bandwidth. We have very flexible RPO, as I mentioned. Uh, all the work that, that's related to diffs and everything. Everything is really proportional to the work you did. And uh, you have kind of very nice feature of ability to do kind of integrity of a volume using because in the volume level you have the uh, fingerprints. So you can build a hash that represents the real data in the volume level and do integrity check to verify that the volume has the same uh, fingerprint. A transport layer, IP, just Ethernet or fiber channel as well. I, I, IP, yeah, yeah, IP, IP. Yeah, so what you do IP uh, out the back of the extreme IO. Uh, there, you can use um, the, uh, the the fiber, uh, the the uh, iSCSI ports as as optical. Or there's also copper as choice as well. Okay, and you guys go. You're not implying you support IP over fiber channel, right? Uh, no. Okay, good. Okay, and so that's just oh. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you can go. Can you go 40 and 100 gig Ethernet off? Uh, DX2 yet? No. Okay. 10 gig. 10 gig only. Okay. okay. And this feature, is this supported with X2 only or X1 as well? X2 only. X2 only. Okay. And this uh, future is not yet available in GA, but it will be available in the upcoming release. Or in tech preview stuff. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so to answer the question, there, mm -hmm. one of the slides that we skipped um, was there are other ways to replicate. For example, X1, for example, uses recover point. Uh, we'll continue to have recover point support. Um, that uses our snapshot technology as well. Um, and that gives you the ability to go ahead and replicate, for example, from X1 to X2. Um, so the native replication, we're going to go forward only on uh, X2 and, and, and beyond. Um, but uh, from, uh, from, a, from an X1 to X2, or also from an X, X2, for example, to a Unity platform or to VMAX all flash, flash platform, we can use uh, recover point. OK. So just to explain what does it mean that we leverage the extreme snapshots. Um, so basically every cycle, uh, according to the, uh, 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 to the RPO, we take a snapshot of, of uh, uh, every volume in that consistency group. We collect them in a snapset group, we call it. We scan and compare for diffs to get the diff between the two uh, uh, be from the previous uh, uh, snapset to the current. For every diff, we send the fingerprints to the other side to check if they exist or not. So the fingerprints are really very small overhead relative to the data. And only for those blocks that don't exist on the other side, we will go and transfer the data in compressed manner. So that's how uh, these things work. But you're saying in a fan-in operation or architecture, you were able to isolate blocks that came from another array, 
So is there some backhaul from the receiving system to tell it about hash? Yeah, uh, uh, no, from it elsewhere? will happen only when I uh, when I want to do the application. It, there is no uh, notification. I got this hash. Okay, so you send the it, hashes. Yeah, it's it's it, it it's proactive. It, it happens when you do. So the protocol works that I send you a batch of hashes and I'm telling you, okay, do you have this or not? Okay. If you have this, you need only to update metadata. If you don't, I go and fetch the data. Okay. Okay, so this is a, a, to illustrate what, what we just uh, discussed. So we have here a, 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 a replication. We have a, a fingerprint. We have here a block of data. We moved it to the other side. We did detected that it's, uh, uh, it exists already. So we only updated the metadata, no need to transfer the data. So in case of uh, four to one, it means that uh, over the uh, link we have four we have a uh, four time savings. Uh, effectively, you get four times uh, 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 link bandwidth, uh, which is uh, uh, really, uh, uh, really important. Here is uh, uh, the, this kind of fanning configuration. Uh, you can, we can do here many games, but eventually you, we're, we're looking here at a case where you, you are, we have a new unique data. It was replicated to the uh, target site. Later on, this same data was written on all the other uh, sites, so this data will not be moved any anymore over the uh, over the the replication link. And we're on IP uh, traffic. Is that uh, an encrypted channel uh, by default? I'm assuming. Uh, I don't know if it's it is not. Okay, it's not encrypted. That's so I saw the word when. I'm just like I realize getting something useful out of deduplicated compressed data is not obvious, but still. Uh, it that, I don't see, but how it is, if, if, even if I have, a, if, even if the link itself is uh, encrypted and I encrypt in the beginning and decrypt at the end, it doesn't affect the data. No, no, it, it was from a security standpoint. It's just sort of, I'm, I, it's my picking responsibility a box. the network layer to make sure that that connectivity yeah. is protected. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Okay. So, so when you um, <clears throat> when you're looking at the hashes and you're saying these hashes may already exist, I I don't need to send them. How many are you sending in that little checklist? Because obviously, if you do that and then it says I need to send it and then you send it, that's a delay compared to not doing it. So, but obviously, the more you batch up, the 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 less overhead that is. I was just thinking if the latency is pretty high, you if you were just sending everything and bandwidth wasn't an issue. The latency would be the big problem, so you might as well just send the block anyway. Yeah, so you are not sending everything because you might have very big uh, volume. Yeah, I didn't take here any assumption on the sizes. So you you do everything in parallel. You handle it in some kind of segment. So the overhead of this uh, of of the metadata is very very small. This kind of protocol and the savings rela relative to the actual saving on the link because you don't transfer the data. It just it's uh, really neglectable, so you, you handle it uh, in, in small chunks. How many exactly hashes do we pack? I don't know, but it's... Uh, what I was just trying to understand was that, obviously, the larger the latency, then the more the potential impact of going back and forth. Or maybe that's not the case. Maybe, you know, I don't no think impact. I remember what we're doing, sorry. It's an asynchronous application, right. so you are not sensitive to latency. What you care about is to handle the bandwidth. Right? So, obviously, if you have a crazy latency, it's a different story, but then you have different issues. But uh, eventually, it's not a latency issue, it's more of a bandwidth. And in the bandwidth, it's really neglectable, this part. So, if you're thinking, you're, you're taking basically the delta difference between uh, time zero and time 15 seconds, for example, if you're doing 15 seconds, we need to transmit those hashes and we'll, we'll push all of those, or we'll push them across in, in, in a group, right? So, the uh, so, so it's not like we're going to push in like one, two, three, four, right? It's not, it's not, no, it's I not bio stream no, I batch that. in terms of the yeah. snapshot diff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? All of this is going to be managed through like some sort of policy management or? Yeah, all this will be managed through the, uh, through the XMS, right? Okay. So the XMS, and for example, one of the things we measure is, you, for example, you might set an, uh, an RPO 15 seconds. And due to WAN bandwidth, right, or latency, right, I'm not able to do a snapshot because I haven't got all the data over there because it's, right. for example, constrained. Um, I will actually alert you on that. And I'll use Extreme Isles alerting mechanism. Um, and we can alert out to uh, via SNMP, uh, via, uh, via the SNMP, via REST API, 
Uh, and um, let's see what else am I missing? Syslog log as well. Okay. Four, seven, I think. What are some of the other futures that you're working on with Extreme IO? That you can so, speak about in a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a ready answer that, for that, that. That's a thin list, isn't it? <laughs> in a public forum, that's a very thin list. I will tell you, we continue, we continue uh, to look, for example, one of the things that Adnan talked about earlier in the VMAX presentation was NVMe. Right? So we're going to deliver NVMe across the platform. Mm -hmm. right? So you can, you can take that for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> but uh, from a platform perspective, we will continue to deliver new functionality on Extreme IO. I can't, unfortunately, in a public non-NDA form, deliver, tell you exactly what we're doing. I apologize. Otherwise, the lawyers will come after me. That's right. Yeah. You really don't want that. No. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Can you talk about how many customers you have that are using Extreme IO at the moment? Uh, currently, uh, north of 7,000 customers. Seven zero? Seven seven thousand. Seven thousand, right. Yeah. Um, I'll have a question. So you put up um, you one of the things the bullets you had on your replication said no one accelerators needed. Yep. Your unit of measure for transferring data from site to site is sixteen KB, yes? Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's sixteen KB. And it's a fixed level fixed block D dude. Mm -hmm. Most WAN accelerators have a variable length dedupe algorithm that does, especially even on, on 4K, I get better. I get another 40% on a 4K block with, with other storage arrays, and you're at a 16 block, and usually when you're able to do that. So I would say you probably get a, some bang for your buck uh, from a, assuming bandwidth isn't as cheap. But, you know, obviously, it's cheap now, but you certainly, I mean, I think from a WAN accelerator at that 16K level would give you some benefit there. Uh, just because of the size of your block, uh, I mean, you're going to have some commonalities of that block over other blocks in your in your world. No, you, yeah. won't have, you won't actually have commonality across the 16K because if it's 16K, if it was the same 16K, it would be deduped. But what if it was close to the same 16K? It, 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 in that case, it would be you would not be uh, not be the same, right? So potentially, if they were statistically, I suppose it's possible that we would get some benefit. Well, let's say I have a, let's say I have a 15K yep. Word document. Yeah, sure. And I change a word. One byte. Yep. One byte or a word, right? Yep. Is that going to look completely different to you across yeah. the entire 15K? Because, or, or is it just going to... For the fifth, yeah, yeah. You, it, you, it will look different. It'll look different. The whole thing yeah. will look different. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, a new block. 15K, it's a new block. No, no, I understand that. But I mean, if I only change one word, binarily, I only have a little bit that's changed. Maybe I bit shifted or whatever. Correct. If I look at it in plain text, it's going to be mostly the same. Uh, with you, it's not? Or in a, in a word doc that was 15K, which would be... It'd be, it's not, it's it would be anything. Yeah, I, I get your point, right? So usually there's a larger group, right? So I'm not changing just a, blo a bit out of, or a byte out of 16K. It's usually, I'm changing something and then the rest of it's the same. That wall, of course, will not change. Um, anything in the 16K that changes will be, would be transmitted across the wire. But that, that's a very specific example of 16K. The, the question of how does the dedupe and the compression, by the way, distributes course the data set, it's a it's a it's a, a it's a difficult question. I can say that uh, for moving from 8K to 16K, we didn't see much of a reduction to the dedupe. Even though you might this this kind of example, you would expect, well, it's it's a killer for the dedupe. Well, it really depends how where did your dedupe came from. Is it does it have a locality in addresses or not? Because you have some kind of uh, these assumptions. So what I'm saying is that and 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 to the other side that if uh, uh, if I have a kind of a maybe you would say a zero a or formatted a, a 16K and I have a small change, what happens in that case? Well, the compression will eat it. Mm -hmm. So you turn off your compression, by the way, in the inner? No, no. We, we don't. We don't actually. We don't believe in turning off. We believe in uh, we're giving all this while everything is on. No unexpected thing. No need to configuration. Not even talking about going into replication. We we, I, I don't see like any reason not to transfer the data you already compressed. We, I didn't mention it, but eventually you also save both on the source and the target resources. So the impact of the replication on your overall performance on the activity of this array <laughs> is, is it's something really, it's, it's a, it's, it can be a game changer. It really helps you. So why would you lose it? Why would you uh, 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 not transfer it already compressed? So what's the motivation? Well, the reason I would say it is because these WAN accelerators also do compression at their end, 
uh, either prior to or in the process of doing their own dedupe, which is a variable length mm -hmm. algorithm, which typically does better for, for the use cases in replication, typically, um, it, it, because of things like bit shifting. And not in all use cases, but in many of them. Uh, and usually, because I, I just work with a lot of storage appliances, I work at the 4K block level. And I know that even though those guys have dedupe, when I run one of a few different kinds of WAN acceleration, I do get between 40, 45% a reduction above and beyond, and this is, you know, I turn their compression off in the replication. Now, I can compress their stuff too, but I will do better than I would have with their compression, which is, you know, compression is compression. Uh, and, and so I'm just, I'm just saying that you've made, so you've made the decision, it's on, don't bother, don't do it. I mean, I, I, I mean, again, with all the different kind of workloads out there, I, don't, I mean, how would it be a big deal for you to give them the user the option to disable that it's replication not, compression or not? So I'll, I'll, um, first of all, you are, I'm, I'm not, uh, you pro you're probably right. So I, like, I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. Uh, what it's I'm saying is, is, you know, the data sets are really uh, very variable. And for sure, there are some for specific, there are, you, I can build different kind of data sets and get you the different result. So it is possible in terms of feasibility, there is no problem. It's not an architectural problem. It's more of a product decision. So, but, uh, but remember, when we do that, it, we're, the block is already deduped and compressed. So we're actually doing more work on Extreme Island to uncompress it, to send it across the wire, to recompress it. it. I just want to uncompress it. Remember, that's... You're, the, you're storing it compressed on disk? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so ah. we're, not, we're not doing anything right, So there's extra. a resource for doing that. There's fine. resource ah, for doing it. Yeah, right. and, and, and realizing that, that when bandwidth, while not it, well it's not it, not as cheaper than it used to, yeah that's a good way to say it very, very much cheaper than it used to be um, in, in many locations it is for sure some it's not for sure yeah if you're if you're going to some areas of the world it's very yeah. still very very expensive especially overseas well oh, or or simply unavailable yes some case. i mean some some of us live in obscure places where <laughs> high internet bandwidth is just a luxury right. unavailable from last century link <laughs> absolutely on, on the resiliency availability side, uh, there's no model for metro clustering at the moment. Uh, no, um, that, no, metro clustering, for example, would require synchronous replication. Yep. Uh, we have many pro products in the portfolio that do that. VMAX. Yep. Uh, VMAX okay. does it. Uh, Vplex does it. Um, some of the mid-range team will talk tomorrow about a technology that does it. Yep. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. We don't have it yet. The we would need synchronous I'm replication to make that work. Most yet. from the point of view, the guys from VMAX raised a very, very good point this morning, which was Vplex was conceived in the disk era. Yeah. And you guys can spit out so much more I than you can saturate a VPlex uh, system pretty quickly, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. for sure. But, but here's, the, here's the other interesting thing. Are we in the era of synchronous replication as much anymore? Because remember, you have an all-flash array that now is getting 0.2 milliseconds, and you're going to go on a WAN. Uh, let's, say, let's be nice and say it's a millisecond, which is probably a nice, being yeah. very, very nice to it. I now take my 0.1 millisecond right and make yeah. it a one, at least a 1.1 millisecond right. Enough. Not necessarily at all flash array performance anymore, right? And that's a very generous WAN latency. Okay, no, that's right. So good. yeah, but but there are for, for requirements. But there are absolutely. ultra low latency providers, specifically from Wall Street to Jersey City, that are down in the 350. Yeah, those are going to be different. That different use case, right? For sure, yeah. different use case. No, no. Yep. But if yep. you look at You're what right. percentage of the world's synchronous replication is between New York and Jersey, Wall Street and Jersey City, a lot. It's more than single digits, <laughs> for sure. For sure. But this falls. So eventually, this falls under the future. We don't yet talk about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> already said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to make it back to the hall. <laughs> yeah, but, but again, it, it comes down to you know the other advantages of Emacs are fit those applications too. That's why we have the portfolio. That's why we're not a single product yeah. company. Okay. Other questions. Can you talk about uh, within X2 what the rules are for turning on disk encryption? On Extreme mm. IO's encryption? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's very easy. It comes in every system if it's legal to sell that to that country. So those of you like that are in Russia, you can't have encryption. Sorry, because uh, the government won't let us. Everybody else, it's here. It's on. Uh, whether you turn it on or off, the same, it's the same performance. It actually will automatically turn it on for you. And uh, oh. disk encryption within Extreme IO, is that software based or nope. you leverage the drive? Self encrypting drive. drives. All right. Yep. Oh. Yeah, we're not, software encryption is not necessarily great, right? You would, if you want to do it, you want to do it in hardware if you can. And uh, so we do it at the drive. It, it depends. Depends on what the business requirements are. Yeah. Is 
the, the same is true for VMAX, or do you know? VMAX does it with controller. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, <laughs> if they're self-encrypting drives, though, how can you turn it off? I mean, and, and keep it off. I mean, could you turn it off? You actually, turn it back basically, on? what you do is you have the encrypt. It's actually always encrypting. You basically lock the key. That's how you turn. So sorry, it's easy. Yeah. Uh, you turn on encryption as you lock the key, right? So as part of um, uh, in uh, in X2 um, and in later versions of X1, we basically just automatically turn lock the key. There's no disadvantage to go ahead and do so. So we, we might as well go ahead and do it, right? So as as was mentioned earlier, right? The the, the days of not encrypting data are going away. Um, so we just do it by default, because it doesn't cost anything. It comes as part of the product. It doesn't cost any economics. It doesn't cost any performance. Why the heck not? Yeah, the self-encrypting drives I've played with work out of the box. They just have, you know, they have a default encryption key. And so they're encrypting. And if you don't change it, they play like they're not, yep. not self-encrypting. That's exactly what they do. Um, some <laughs> of the HCI vendors charge ridiculous differences for self-encrypting drives, though. Sure. Uh, I don't know. It, it appears to me the vendors charge substantially less. And SSDs, it's basically free. We, we, we made the decision, right? So originally in the X1, we had unencrypted versions and encrypted versions we made the decision. Let's simplify the platform. There's no reason why not. The economic costs for us weren't very different uh, to purchase the hardware. So we're like, right, let's do it. Makes it simpler for us, makes it simple for our customers. Why not?